So I am the director of research computing at the University of Alberta. The University of Alberta has roughly 40,000 students and I have six staff that report to me at the U of A. I'm also the CEO of our Prairie's digital research infrastructure collaboration across the provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. It won't go forward. What happened here? There. Um, the Canadian model is one of uh, collaboration across the entire country. So underpinning any kind of local and regional efforts is a national organization, the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. Um, the advanced research computing aspect of that had prior, uh, previously been called Compute Canada. Um, research data management is also a mandate of the Alliance. And then research software um, is coming across from our national networking organization, Canary, and is still being transferred in. We have five major host sites across the country. University of Victoria hosts our cloud, one of our cloud environments. And then the general purpose clusters are at Simon Fraser University, uh, Waterloo, and sited at ETS, but uh, run by McGill in Montreal. And then the large uh, memory, uh, tightly coupled system is at the University of Toronto. On top of that are our regional organizations, which have changed recently. ACENET serves all of the Atlantic provinces, Calco, Quebec, self-evident, Compute Ontario, same. Uh, and then out west, we used to have West Grid, which uh, in the past year has divided strategically and, and tactically into two organizations, the BC, uh, Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, and then Prairie's DRI. Operationally, we try to remain uh, a broad co uh, cooperation in servicing researchers, and we refer to that as West DRI, uh, for lack of a better term. So if we zoom into our Western region, because I can speak to it a bit better, there are research computing uh, staff and research data management staff at uh, the listed institutions. So in BC, that would be Simon Fraser, UBC and the University of Victoria. Here on the prairies, that would be the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, University of Manitoba, and the University of Saskatchewan. But researchers exist also at other universities, polytechnics, colleges, research hospitals. And in, in, uh, in the case of BC, Triumph, which is a particle physics uh, effort. Operationally, again, we try to support the researchers more broadly. So tickets may be answered uh, by anyone pretty much across the entire West, regardless of where uh, the researchers home institution might be. So the way this is run is we, of course, offer support across six time zones. That makes us five and a half hours wide. Newfoundland's only a half an hour ahead of, say, Halifax. Uh, we have one ticketing system for the entire country, which is based on OTRS, basically. And the answers typically come from an analyst in your own region or your research field, depending on uh, the specificity of your question. And data sharing is a common enough occurrence among uh, researchers that we actually have uh, material on our documentation site to assist with that. The way accounts are handled is that a PI applies for her own or his own account and then sponsors the other accounts in their research group. The PI can apply for an allocation if they need more than 50 core years. Um, or they just arrange that their students uh, make use of the 20% or so of the clusters that are held back for default use or on-demand use. Storage is allocated by project generally um, with a base amount for default. So accounts can access those project files and 
and the scratch uh, area on the systems. And so a lot of this is handled, you know, through those accounts. And so sharing access is fairly easy um, simply because it doesn't matter if a PI is from the University of Alberta or the University, uh, you know, McGill University, um, they can get their group set up and then they can share as easily with, you know, someone at another institution as they can at their own institution, you know, with respect to advanced research computing, um, coordinating discussions around access to data once it's published that falls more into the research data management realm and so we do have some repositories um, that are either field-based or you know a national provision like our federated data repository further uh, and so a lot of this it's just kind of baked into the canadian system of provision it's unlike say uh, what Purdue had done historically where they had, you know, up to five systems that they just kept building, get rid of the oldest one, and, and then collaboration is a coordination between the institutions. It's kind of baked into the way we approach this um, more generally in Canada. So that's kind of a very quick overview of how we approach interinstitutional collaborations um, within research computing, at least. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then we can look at if there are questions, that's fine. Or we can hold those to the end after Gil delivers his as well. I don't see anything immediately in the chat. So let's hold until after Gil presents. Yep, um, sounds good. That sounds like a, a really well-structured way to facilitate interinstitutional collaboration. Um, yeah, do you have, are you able to share your screen, Gil? Sorry about that. Uh, uh, yes, I, uh, I believe so. Let me just uh, uh, move this up here. Uh, can you guys see my, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so just to begin, I, this is a, a slightly different uh, uh, sort of uh, facet of the entire discussion of, uh, of uh, inter-university uh, collaborations. What, what I'm really going to focus on is, is, is sort of a, a quantitative means that we, have, uh, we are exploring. And I should say this is, in a sense, in a, in a very real sense, very preliminary, a lot of this uh, a lot of the things I'll show were, were compiled probably within this morning and, and just trying to get everything, uh, sort of my thoughts together. Um, but the, uh, the, the basic idea here is, um, it, you know, it, well, let me just tell this sort of as a story how this all sort of began uh, that, that might uh, make this a bit more coherent. Uh, so what we, we did was uh, we wanted to look at, um, really this, this began as sort of a, a we're, we, you know, uh, I'm, belong to the uh, centralized uh, uh, computing and facilitation uh, part of our university, as a, as, a, as a lot of us do here in CARC. And uh, part of, as you guys know, what we do is we try to sort of justify the, the return on investment of centralized computing as sort of a, uh, an ongoing uh, discussion. And this is approached in a wide variety of ways, right? We can look at uh, you know, some, some, some of the approaches have looked at publications and, and grants that have been enabled through having access to, uh, uh, to uh, a centralized compute. What we thought we would try to do was look at the impact on collaborations um, from having a centralized resource like research computing. So um, just to give you a sense of what you're looking at in the figure on the right there is, this is an ASU only network, okay? So this is only uh, Arizona State researchers uh, compiled. These are researchers over the span of 2015 to 2021. Um, every circle in this, in this network is a researcher, and every edge between each of those circles is a uh, collaboration of some sort. It's either a publication that was written between two of those, uh, two of those researchers as, a, as, a, uh, as co-authorship, or it's uh, a, a grant, uh, an award uh, in which they were co-PIs. 
And what we did was we just drew this network. We queried, we used this uh, dimensions API to query and basically pull out all of the uh, all of these types of collaborations, and 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 uh, we were able to construct this network. Now there's a little bit, uh, yeah. I, I do want to say that every time we we move to a, a rep, sort of a visualized, you know, visualization of, of our data, we really there are a lot of caveats. One here that I do want to say is that uh, a lot of edges are duplicated because if you have, for example, uh, three authors collaborating on a, let's say they're co-authors on a paper, then each of they'll, they'll be for one publication there'll be redundant edges, right? There's going to be an edge drawn between every pair, so there's going to be three. And as you might imagine, it's this. Uh, uh, you know, n times n minus one over two for, you know, for whatever n is. So if you have 10 co-authors, you know, you're, you're going to have 45 edges representing that one publication, right? So, but, but that said, I mean, this sort of allows us to, to get a visualization of, a, of an entire research community uh, and, and sort of do an assessment. And what was the idea of this assessment? Well, what we did was we, we identified the researchers who had accounts on our cluster, and uh, we said, okay, well, what? Let's let's just run some numbers on these on these folks as in comparison to the other nodes, you know, the other nodes of the people that don't have accounts. And what we found was statistically, across several metrics, uh, uh, the the research computing nodes uh, were statistically higher in every metric that we could that we uh, ran. So, for example, uh, we looked at. Uh, first of all, you just look at degree, right? What's the average number of collaborations? The average number of collaborations was statistically higher for uh, research computing nodes. But then we looked at other uh, network assessments. There are ones that are called their centrality metrics. So for example, uh, how hub-like is a node uh, within the network? And hub-like means, you know, do, you know, do they, ha they have a lot of connections? Maybe with it, imagine within a department, they may have a lot of connections within that department. And, uh, and, and relative to the other people in that department, right? And they may network to other people in other departments more often. And we looked at these centrality metrics, between the centrality, closeness centrality, eigenvector centrality, and in every one of these centralities, uh, and, and, and I can explain uh, further uh, if, you, if you want interpretations of how these, how these centralities relate uh, to collaborativeness as we see it, or integrativeness within a research community. But the point is that, these research comp computing nodes were always higher. Um, so, um, and, and, when I mean, and with a statistical significance of, of, of P, a very small P. So uh, we were very excited about this, right? And we thought, okay, this is a nice uh, result to have. Uh, and, and you can see this has run over several years. Um, um, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, and and uh, so that, I'm gonna get to that in a sec, but, 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 but let me just say there was one characteristic that was, a bit, that was a bit interesting that we immediately jumped out at us. And that was this idea of the giant components. So just imagine you're drawing this network. You got all the researchers in your community and you're connecting them all with edges. Well, there's gonna be this one sort of, as you can see here, this is just giant set of nodes that are all interconnected to each other. Now, some of them, as you, as you by the way, I just, sorry to explain this, the blue nodes, okay, are the research computing nodes in this network. And the radius of those nodes is sort of a composite of those of those centralities I was talking about. It's a composite of, of you know degree between us and all the other centralities. And we just sort of wanted to wanted to see how those sat. And and as you move out from the center of this network to the outside, you're you're basically becoming more and more uh, you know less and less connected to the network. But what you are seeing here is the giant component. That is that that for this group of nodes, the next to last bullet, as you can see here. This is 59, sorry, 5,960 researchers represented, but it's 90% of the university. In other words, there's another 10% that's sort of floating around and unconnected. And that's over six years. If I were to go year to year, okay, this becomes uh, even worse. So let me, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and show you guys a, um, a, a, a representation of this that, that we've, we've, we've kind of, uh, uh, upgraded a little bit our uh, our uh, 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 our picture of this. So let, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share a, 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 a visualization with you in a second if it comes up. Um, oh, it's still compiling. It's okay. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna do share screen and. Okay, 
can you can some can you guys see this network? Is that visible? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so what you see here, this is a single year. Okay, this is 2021 ASU network only. Um, we've got, you know, the, the green nodes, if you can see them, I know they're kind of small or the research computing ones. We, we haven't scaled them, uh, they're radii like we did in the other one. But you see there's 3,670 nodes here, 9,048 edges, okay? It looks a bit sparser. This is again over only one year, but more significantly, what I'd like you to see is there's all of these nodes that are floating over here to the right. Okay, the giant component in, in here is, is a lot smaller. It's not 90%, it's, it's much smaller. So what, what were the implications of this? Um, and by the way, we're, we're, we're super excited about our visualizations of this, just to uh, kind of give you guys a, you know, you know we, we, I don't know, the, the tools just get better and better for visualizing. Uh, oh, this is a nice one, right? You can really, you can really see how, the, how the other, all the other nodes are sort of floating around and the, and the giant component, not so giant, you know? Um, so, um, so we, this caused a, a, a problem. So let me, uh, all right, I was, sorry guys, this is so, uh, um, we're, we're just, we're, we're, uh, okay, I'm gonna go back to my uh, slides so I can, so I can show you what, what we're doing here. Okay, uh, okay, does this, uh, so you should see my, um, my uh, PowerPoint again? Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. So what were the implications? Okay. So we thought, so here's the, here's the point. Um, we had this, this network we were super excited about. We thought, okay, well, we can make statements about collaborativeness. Well, that was super exciting. Um, and we could, you know, we could talk about different kinds of collaborativeness, right? We could talk about number of co-authorships. We could talk about uh, how, how central, as I said, in these departments, these people were, or how influential they were upon each other. But there was, but there was these missing connections, right? I mean, when you talk to any researcher, like you may, you know, they sometimes we talk to researchers, and by the way, all these, we've anonymized all these graphs, so you're not going to see any names of researchers, because, you know, immediately, as soon as you start measuring something, people start to get nervous. They're like, well, oh my goodness, well, what's my degree? You know, what, you know, are, are, are faculty going to be assessed by this? So we thought, okay, well, um, we'll just anonymize this, because we're really just looking for the character of, of, of the overall university. But when we did look up people, they'd say, well, you know, the reason I have such a low degree and such a low centrality is I've got all these collaborators at other universities and you're missing all that. You know, you're missing all this information. And it's true. It's a really incomplete way to show uh, a research collaboration network is to just look at the university itself. Um, now we could say in terms of our research computing assessment, right? We could say, well, everybody's at that disadvantage, aren't they? And that's true. But but what we wanted to look at things like this. So this was what we wanted, what we tried to do then was we, we thought, okay, let's come up with a notion of innovativeness, okay? If I look at ideas or new uh, concepts, new algorithms as, a, a, and use a disease model, so I'm gonna infect a researcher with a new idea, okay? How well does that new idea propagate across the network? And so what we did was we infected using this agent-based model, using the network, the research network that you just saw, um, how well do these ideas propagate across our, our network? Well, um, we found statistically, we, what we wanted to find, I should say statistically, is that a research computing uh, 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 research, you know, somebody who, who uses our centralized compute uh, can propagate an idea much more effectively uh, than a, a non-RC user. Now, what happened was, was interesting, you can see from these plots here, the green, okay, are the non-RC users, the red are the and I probably switched colors on you, which is which is diabolical, and I shouldn't shouldn't have done that. But I, but bear with me here. Um, but you you know you see that there's really wide bands here. I mean, even though you visually you can see yes, you know the cumulative infected from a, re a research computing user is higher. Okay, across the network, why why are these bands so damn thick? Well, they're thick for one really sad reason, and that is that whenever we infect somebody who's not in the giant component, well, that idea dies. And so, we, so what we realized is the penalty we pay for only looking at internal collaborations is we can't, do, we can't even do this. The, the, there, was, there was no real statistical significance to this. I mean, we, we ran all these different infection chances. Yeah, if we, if we toyed with it, if we played with the model, we got one of them to be significant, barely. It was like you know, a p-value of 0.023 or something. And it wasn't, it wasn't compelling, right? So we thought, okay, this is what we got to do. We got to we got to move on. We got to get to these. Um, uh, so, so let's talk about the extended collaboration network and what's involved there. So what you see on the right is a screen capture. 
of a, the extended collaboration network for research computing researchers. And what we've done here is we've colored, uh, we have a two colors of nodes. Red is an ASU researcher and yellow is a, uh, is, is, is a consolidated external collaboration. So what does that mean? We, well, we, you go out, right? And you gotta, now you gotta query dimensions for all of the external collaborations um, of an ASU researcher. Um, and, and what ends up happening is you end up with an enormous uh, number of collaborations. As it turns out, the, 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 uh, you know, it's, a, it's an order of magnitude. And the problem is if you try to assign each one of those uh, external collaborators a node, well, you know, not only does it break your visualization, but you, you know, you also kind of, uh, you kind of the, the network you're actually interested in, which is you know, this, this ASU network of researchers becomes a bit dwarfed out. So what we did was we did the following and, and we, we basically said, okay, every collaborator from a specific institution, we're just gonna combine into one node. So each one of those yellow nodes, and as you can see, I don't know, maybe it's hard to see it, but there's one node that's labeled there. It says University of Arizona, Tucson. Okay, because that is the, now that one node is the highest degree node in the entire ASU network. That's an interesting thing, right? I mean, I granted, yes, there's a lot of collaborators at, at the U of A. If we represented them all individually, they probably would have a low degree. But when we combine them into one, the largest collaborator is, is, is the U of A. I mean, I mean, the most collaborative, I should say the most collaborative node in this network is the U of A. Which is which is a profound thing to, when you think about it. What would it? So so it speaks to a couple of things, right? If we're if if somebody were to simply ask the naive question, why exactly are external collaborations important, right? I mean that I mean we talk if we want to have a conversation about fostering these external collaborations. First, I guess we should say why are they important? Well, they're important because it as it turns out, these these uh, external collaborations uh, in these institutions. Um, form a critical piece. I mean, what, what they end up doing, okay, is, um, is, is well, I, just to jump to the end here, because I feel like I'm going long, um, is they end up increasing the uh, giant component percentage. So it, uh, let me, uh, I just want to see if I missed anything. So uh, by the way, yeah, I do want to say that last bullet, edges more than doubled when we uh, added this in. And, and the significant thing to understand there is when we say edges more than doubled, I'm just saying that when we've consolidated all of these external collaborators into institutions, and there's only maybe, uh, or only, but you know, there's something like around the order of 500 to 600 uh, external institutions, the edges, so that's a single edge from like our ASU researcher to University of Arizona, right? Even though they might've collaborated with 20 of these people, it's all just one. So, so you've doubled your edges even with that consolidation. Um, anyway, the overall effect was this. So this is year to year, what is the percentage in the giant component? So I showed you guys that 2021, it was about six, it was less than 60% of the nodes were in the giant component. Look at the effect when you include those external collaborators, right? And if you look, and if you consolidate over all the years, you get 98%. So, so what that means is we can now run these agent-based models a little bit more reliably and a little more, uh, I'd say convincingly um, to, to, to look at idea propagation. Um, I, I, I guess the only things I would I would add um, to uh, I, there's so many so many thoughts I've had but but I would say this uh, for there it is a bit of a um, you know look we're, we're we're consolidating all these these external collaborators in, into institutions and that may look at first blush like a bit of a uh, of a leap but I but 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 let me let me put it to you this way let's say okay, we did include all those nodes, okay? And let's say that, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, an ASU collaborator with, a, with a, one U of A collaborator and another ASU collaborator to yet another one, those two U of A, distinct US, U of A collaborators may not have any connection between them. But they likely do, if, if U of A is anything like ASU or any of the other universities re, uh, represented by those yellow dots are anything like ASU, then they probably do have a giant component that's a lot like our giant component. And by the by, what I mean by that is not our not our local giant component, but our extended giant component. In other words, if you were to keep uh, iterating right over every node that connects to every other node across the entire national network, these 
these nodes actually do connect to each other. So it's so so I would say that um, I, well I don't know I'm I'm pretty convinced that these uh, that that these consolidated nodes are uh, are fairly representative of what what it what the what the general behavior of the overall uh, national network would look like uh, without breaking my visualization. Um, and the only other comment I'm going to add is that uh, what's interesting to me about looking over the years, I, I think there's really compelling things about looking at these things over time. But what we notice when we consolidate the years is that the giant component gets, gets, gets very close to 100%. And, and what I think that says to us is that there's a lot of mobility. People move. They go from one institution to another, and they bring their collaborations with them. And when they do that, that really improves the connectivity. I mean, it gets us closer and closer to that to that uh, to that one hundred percent. So, with that, I'll I'll uh, I'll close. I, I, only to say that if anybody wants to work with us on this, we're really eager to look for partners to uh, do, obviously do comparisons and 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 you know we'd like to compare ourselves and look at you know uh, different types of schools, different types of institutions. Uh, so, happy to uh, collaborate with anybody and uh, and and, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Gil. That's a very interesting way to quantify like how people are collaborating within and outside institutions. Um, I've been seeing a lively discussion going on in chat, um, mostly about Scott's uh, presentation, but I think right now we can open it up to um, just general discussion. Um, we did have a third presenter scheduled at one point who was going to speak on how the challenges of doing inter institutional collaboration at a smaller institution. So if anyone um, has comments on that, we would welcome that perspective. But yeah, if um, I guess if um, I'm not really sure to pick up in the chat, um, but I guess if you want to ask a question, um, raise your hand and I'll call on you in the, the Zoom um, interface. All right, I see one hand, uh, go for it. I can't see your name, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, Lisa, hi from UCLA. The questions are for Gil, and I really loved your visualizations, but I want to ask you kind of fundamentally how this research has has informed the development of your resources and services, how it's changed your operations, and how are you using this data with administrators? Yeah, I have to say, I, you know, the, Lisa, I, the uh, um, uh, the ink is still very, very wet on a lot of this. I, I you know, and, and I really do, uh, you know, the one thing I will say, uh, you know, we've gone, you go to upper administration and they've, they're very busy people and you try to make these compelling arguments to them about why they should, you know, why do I, should I invest millions of dollars in, in a centralized compute resource, right? And you have to make it very quickly. And it's very easy to pick apart sort of these things. And so I'm always sort of uh, trying to get all the arguments exactly right. I, but I will say this, um, Picture is really uh, a compelling and uh, succinct way to, to communicate things. If you if you can show uh, you know a, a network uh, that's that's very disconnected and one that's very densely connected, I think that 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 can rapidly get your get the point across. And uh, well, if you can make it an animation, then then it's mesmerizing and you've, that's it. But um, uh, we hope to definitely uh, 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 promote these uh, these these results as we get them. As soon as we feel like we, uh, they're airtight. Thank you. Venice, did I address your question well enough there in the chat? Hi, Scott. Thanks. I'm just seeing your second part here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, it sounds like you have an interesting back and forth with the institutional staff, and then you have some RDM staff within the the alliance. National Alliance organization, yes. Can you talk a little bit more about what the RDM staff within the alliance do? So a lot of that uh, staff is working on the development of um, 
persistent identifiers, um, the platforms on which a lot of that will work. So a lot of them are coding the platforms that, that will get used nationally. Um, some of them are involved in some of the uh, existing repositories. Um, and there's a move to transition the data management planning platform off of the U of A's hands into the Alliance National uh, Service Delivery. And so it's not that we would be moving our staff from the U of A, from University of Alberta. I'll, I'll try to avoid U of A from here on, uh, U Alberta over to the Alliance, but more that that transition would occur and then other people would maintain and operate that um, platform. Okay, nice, thank you. But I, I do sit, so Canadian institutions right now, all by March 31st, 2023, must have institutional research data management strategies published. Um, Dalhousie's has been out for a while. Um, you know, down in the US, you can see like Cornell has an especially, you know, I think they're on version seven of theirs or eight. Um, so Canadian institutions are all developing local strategies for dealing with the research data management because it's being driven by the Tri-Council uh, that fund health, science, and uh, humanities, social science research. And so I'm on that panel with people from our VP research office our libraries and uh, IT. Um, we've got a question from Lisa in the chat and she's asking Scott to talk a little bit about this Canadian model, how this Canadian model supports disaster recovery and failover. Right. Um, the concept behind it back in 2015 was that two of the major general purpose clusters would be uh, redundant by design. The problem is even at that time, people understood that every cycle was gonna get used. And so having them, and they didn't end up identical by any means, but the system at Waterloo and the system at Simon Fraser were meant to be identical. Um, and that would there need to be servicing, you could just magically transfer across, which. Yeah, you can take a job across and submit it to the, you know, Slurm queuing system, but it's not like there are, you know, redundant cycles laying around waiting for people to make use of them. Um, people are responsible for backing up their own data. Uh, for instance, you know, Scratch is not backed up at all. Project space is backed up. Um, to near line if, if people desire. So, um, which near line is mostly tape based. Um, but the, the, the handy thing is that you can migrate jobs from one cluster to the next readily. If, you're, if your field is heavily data dependent, say particle physics, then you've got challenges because it can take you a long time to migrate the data set from one cluster to the next. If you're a computational chemist, you can actually get a great deal of work done by you know, submitting your jobs on the various clusters in the default or shared uh, access uh, and, and get a lot of work done. We had one University of Alberta researcher that did not have an allocation managed to do about 750 uh, core years worth of work last year uh, without using an allocation, which is highly unusual. Um, his students were particularly adept at developing their jobs as very small atomic jobs, get them in between the larger jobs. Was that sufficient, Lisa? Yes, thank you very much. And I'm stunned that you let that researcher take that much compute time? Uh, it was only really noticed, uh, I guess, 
a lot of the monitoring uh, and data analytics are more recent. Um, and so it was only noticed in the aggregate uh, after about three quarters worth of that time. So the good news is, as Timothy says, you know, you have one or two of those highly creative users, but that's not the preponderance of your people. Um, to balance that out, we have people who ask for and get awarded, you know, 400 core years or 400 worse, you know, 50 to 100 GPU years and don't make use of it. And then they try to get that same allocation the following year. They do have to file, file every year for an allocation right now. And uh, they don't make use of it. And so their story the following year has to be especially convincing. Um, I have actually have a question for you, Scott. Um, so sure. it's so if, if I if you had like 30 seconds in an elevator with somebody in the US who could impact this like progress towards something more similar to this in the US, like what's your what's your elevator speech? Well, I I as the research computing director at the University of Alberta, the fifth or sixth largest institution in Canada, I am very grateful that I managed to support about 400 or 500 active PIs in digital research without having to have 30 staff. Um, Gregory, who's on the call from Manitoba, will say yes, but that's because one of my staff members is picking up a lot of the load. I'll remember, remind Gregory that five years ago, it was my staff member that was doing that. And so it all balances out, but it's nice having this national organization that's able to support users, the user researcher facing part, but we also have people across that, that are system facing. So the, the uh, scheduler national team lead is at the University of Alberta. His second is at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, and the staff are spread all across the country. So we benefit from that network. Is it uh, a bear to coordinate to some degree. Are the benefits worth it? We think so. I like how you led with staff savings. That's that's always good for upper management. Yes. Uh, also useful is that we have stats that I can take back to a dean. And for instance, I can have a discussion with a dean of science and say, your peers, your colleagues, fellow PIs, made use of $2.25 million worth of research re, uh, resources that you didn't pay for, didn't take up any space in your uh, buildings, and were not on your budget or your financial reporting. Can you imagine what you would have to do to have that $2.25 million or have each one of them individually applying for small grants that would make up that 2.25? That justifies my staff. That's the story that I use as a director to prove the utility of my staff and that of peer institutions, because a lot of times the VPRs will talk to each other. Yeah, that's a compelling story for sure. That's speaking business rather than technology. You know, a dean doesn't care about, you know, gigahertz or terabytes or exabytes of data. Oh, yeah, I'd be a bilingual. <laughs> mm -hmm. I really like Gil's uh, visualizations. We had a visualization like that of our staff, actually, and how the teams were all networked, and you could determine where the, what institution they were from as well. So it was based on the humans providing service and support. Um, rather than the use of cycles by collaborators or internal to ASU. Yeah, speaking of the visualizations, forgive me if you said what tool it was, but can you repeat what tool you're actually using to make these visualizations? I didn't say. Um, you know, I, after, you know, it, it escapes me what it is called. We, de we downloaded it and installed it. I will... Uh, um, I will add that to my uh, slides, which I will uh, share, and I will and I'll put that in. Put Thank in. you. I'm glad that I wasn't just being inattentive. 
Gladys, did we get the questions, if any, were put in the call document? I think most of them are in the chat. I think that most of them are actually already in the Google Doc. I will look in the Google Doc to see if there was anything that wasn't in the chat that's aimed at me, and I'll update that if necessary. Thank you, Scott. So um, since the questions have died down and, and we still have a few minutes left, um, just a question for the audience is what what questions do these presentations bring up that might be like good topics for future calls or areas to dig into? What like what's what's your burning questions? So, Tobin, do we got um, Adam's question answer about eye graphs and? Oh, I think Adam was asking um, Gil if the tool he used was called eye graph or Gephi. Was that one of the ones that you used? No, it, what, that's the thing. It's not Gephi. We tried Gephi, but we, um, and that is a great tool, I should say. Uh, uh, but this is one that you can launch in a browser. Uh, and, and so you don't need to use the Gephi tool. Uh, it's a, um, it's, uh, it, for some reason, it's, the name is totally escaping me, but um, I, 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 I'll get it. I guess uh, also along the lines of the elevator pitches, this is how you support over 10,000, somewhere between 10 and 25,000 users with about 200 staff across the country, um, leaning in from, I think we have staff at about 50 institutions across Canada. Um, so that's kind of the distribution of how, how that works. And the 200 are both system facing and uh, researcher facing. Scott, how many users did you say? It's, uh, I don't have an exact number. I think it's somewhere between 10 and 25,000. Excellent, thanks. Any other questions for the presenters? There's a bit of juggling that's done uh, when your researchers are not quite understanding where they're doing their work because there's a national ticketing system and then there's of course the U Alberta ticketing system for standard IT issues. And so my staff uh, spend a non-zero amount of time transferring tickets from the local to the national uh, platform. We just had a math prof ask for an account yesterday and he asked locally. So, you know, the staff just have to pick it up and flip it over to the other system. But it's not a significant drain on our time at this point. Yeah, I think that happens inside institutions as well, so. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, Scott, is there anything that um, like, you seem to have a really comprehensive um, infrastructure, but like what's missing? Like, is there a, a thing on your to-do list um, that you wish you had? Uh, consistent funding um, has been a problem historically. And so getting, we've switched from a, an episodic envelope-based funding model to what we're hoping will be a continual funding by the federal government. Um, that will help. We have seven-year-old uh, clusters right now nationally, so nodes are dying left, right, and center. Um, the refresh is urgently required, and because Compute Canada folded into the alliance just in April, there are teething pains around this transition. Uh, and as a regional CEO, rather than my other hat at the U of A, U Alberta, um, I'm part of trying to get that driven over the starting line, basically. 
Um, so once we actually get that switched over, uh, the systems will be refreshed on a regular basis rather than, oh, well, the federal government handed an envelope to the Canada Foundation of uh, Innovation. So you get systems, you know, this year and not the other year. Well, thanks for that. Yep. Great. We have um, five minutes left, and this is typically the time where we hand it over to closing. And I, I'm going to hand the mic over to Annalie to so, um, bring us out of the call. All right. Um, thank you very much, Tobin. So um, I'm here to um, reiterate again our, our, our gratitude and thanks for, to Scott um, from the University of Alberta and Gil from Arizona State. So um, two, two locations with A's that should not be confused um, uh, for presenting on this really um, broad topic of interinstitutional collaboration, a couple of uh, specific cases. And um, I know we've learned a lot from that. So please follow up with them as, as you wish. Um, the session has been recorded and we'll be sending out an email with the link to that recording when it's when it's up. Um, the next thing I want to um, emphasize again, we've said a few times, but we actually don't have a topic set for next month. So um, this is my final opportunity to ask you to please um, check out the link. I will post it again actually in chat. Um, we have, a, I think, four topics that we've come up with that had um, others had expressed interest about. So you could um, just choose, click on a, a button, radio button. You don't have to come up with a topic. If something there looks interesting to you, that would be helpful. Or if you, if you have any other ideas that you want to suggest um, now or any time, you know, in the coming weeks and months, that would be super helpful. So um, thanks again to all of the steering committee members who are here and who have helped uh, make this call possible. Uh, it's a great collaborative group, and we welcome any of you who are in attendance today if you're interested in um, engaging further, um, we'd welcome new members to our steering committee. So please reach out to Tobin or Justin or any of us um, uh, if, you, if you might be interested in or just like to know what's involved. So I think with that, we can close. Um, so it was great to see you all and we'll look forward to seeing you again next month. And thank you so much. <laughs>